Good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I'm your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. The show is broadcast live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. You can always uh, go to our website. We do record the show every week, and you can go to our website and watch the archives later. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our recordings and archives. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch, so um, please share um, anywhere and everywhere with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, anyone you think would be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Um, for those of you not uh, here from Nebraska, um, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries in Nebraska. Um, we, so we serve all types of libraries in the state. So, so you will find, in the state, <laughs> uh, so you will find topics and um, sh things on our show and in our archives for publics, K-12, academic and colleges and universities, corrections, museums, um, historical societies, I can't think special. of any special, special libraries, anything so that, many. yeah, I know, <laughs> archives, anything that has a library or is related to doing anything libraries like, um, there's potentially be a topic on our show for them. So we really cover the gamut. Um, and we do a mixture of things here on the show, book reviews, interviews, mini training sessions, um, demos of services and products. Uh, sharing uh, cool things we think libraries could be doing or should be doing. Um, that we do. We have um, guest speakers that come in sometimes from outside of Nebraska and outside of the Library Commission uh, to talk about things they're doing in their libraries. Uh, we also have Library Commission staff that present on things that we're doing specifically here um, within Nebraska or um, via the Library Commission. Uh, today we have Library Commission staff here with us. <laughs> uh, Sally Snyder is here joining me, our coordinator of children and young adult library services at the Nebraska Library Commission. And she does a um, few different shows over the year for us. Um, uh, new books for whatever the upcoming um, summer reading program is, which already was done last year. Um, and then kind of a a pair, a duo right, of, yeah. of sessions, one on best new children's books, for the previous year that have come up, and one for Best New Teen Books. That's what we're talking about today is the teen one. Yes. Um, so this is a companion show to the previous one that was done for children. So if you are um, the children's librarian or children slash teen, children YA for your um, library, the on January 15th, she did the Best New Children's Books of 2019, um, along with Dana Fontaine, who's from our Fremont High School here in Nebraska. This chick will be here. So you can watch that one on recording, and this one today we'll be talking about the teen books, um, and then you have both of them will be out there. So I will just hand it over to you, Sally, okay. to um, talk about what was in our uh, teen books this time. Before we get started on the reviews, I want to show you where the list is, so you can print that off at any time, and you don't have to write everything down because mm -hmm. we've already done that for you. So here's the Library Commission main page, and I can't see, oh, there he is. Yeah, and so if you go to there. the search box right here and type in handouts, which I don't have to go very very far before yeah, it will automatically up. start. Yeah, pull it and the first you. thing that comes up has a star by it because it's so important. No, that just <laughs> means it's the best match. And so this, whoops, this is the index of staff handouts from staff. So far, it's all me. I've told people they can share this page. You just put a blurb of what it's about and stick your handouts in there. But maybe I need to to say so again. So right here in the 2019 best books. Whoops, sorry. I can't see this very well because uh, of the light. There's the 2019. That is my long list for mm -hmm. the list that, that um, Dana and I did at the Encompass and at conference. They're down here below. These are the same list that we did again on for the Encompass Live as well. So that's my long children's booklet. And there's my best teen books booklet. And you click it and you get a PDF you can print out. I'm so proud it even says, February 5 on it. <laughs> so that's awesome. how you how you get there. And go back. And you can see also there above that was also the list for um as I mentioned the summer reading program. Oh true. Um yeah, so right. uh, go back and on the handouts page there. So there we go. There we go. Whoops. There. So for uh, oh, this can. yeah, for this summer's coming upcoming, I know some libraries have already gotten this, but you yeah. can still get you got some time. Um there's her list from when she did that session as well. Um and the and we'll show you in the archives too. There's an archives 
um, the recorded of that session as well. If you want to also hear Sally talk okay. about the um, that was on December 31st. Um, Shall I go there now? No, no, okay. I'll show it. It's later. Yeah, okay. it's not a problem. So um, you can watch okay. the recording of that and hear her talk about them. But there's her actual, actual list too. If you just want to print that off and have that for you. So that's how you find that. And so let's get well, into our team there, we'll book there. And if you just hit F5, it should. Uh, Found you. Boom. There you I go. I didn't know that. Yeah. Look, I changed that too to February. That, that's <laughs> Sometimes it's, this was the session <laughs> from last conference, yeah. but it's okay. Well, that's part of what I have to say. This is the session. This is my session for the Nebraska School Librarians Association that's right. presentation, which was the Saturday after the Nebraska Library Association, Iowa Library Association joint conference. That was last October. Oh, that was last October. But I've added a whole but you've updated, four yeah. new titles. I thought okay. there would be more by now. <laughs> yeah. But four, four more made the list. So okay. that's good. And I do want, for people who maybe haven't heard me give reviews before, these are the books that I've encountered, meaning mm -hmm. we receive review books here at the Library Commission from some publishers, but not all publishers. True. And we don't receive every single book any one publisher publishes mm -hmm. for teens. So it's um it's kind of a hodgepodge, but great mm -hmm. ones are in there. I also look at the public library all the time. I look at blogs and other mm -hmm. things for titles I should be finding. And I go to the bookstore and wander around and find things there too. So I do my best to encounter titles from all kinds of publishers. Mm -hmm. But when I am talking about books, if your favorite book from 2019 is not listed, that doesn't mean I didn't like it or I didn't think it was good for libraries. It just means probably I didn't Maybe encounter didn't it. See it. Didn't find it yet. Or I had it but I didn't get it read. Oh, mm -hmm. and that's even worse. Yeah. Pretend I didn't say that. Yes. Yeah. So but if you do have any uh, thoughts, you know, as as we're going through here yeah. and after you see this, if there's any books that you um have read that you think might you know, Sally should know about, or you want to let her know that could be a good one for the list. Um, go ahead and type into the question section um, if you don't see anything coming up or any authors or anything. She's always looking for more more, more things to read. Yes, I am. <laughs> Plus, we can say right now during this session, if there's one out there that I didn't happen to run across, that here's another one someone might want to look into mm -hmm. and see about adding to yeah. their collection. Mm -hmm. So please do that. So because I am a, a linear thinker, I start with books for younger teens, because younger teens, nonfiction, older teens, that's how I operate. I could change it up, mm -hmm. but that would make me twitch. <laughs> anyway, I okay. just think so. So the first book on the list is Running Wild. And five years ago, their mother died. That was when Dad took Willa, who is now 12, and her younger twin brothers, Keith and Seth, who are now 10, to Alaska to live off the land. Things have been okay until this summer when Dad returned from his annual trip to town with liquor. He had quit drinking when Willow was born, but now he has started again. It is fall, and Willa knows they do not have enough food for the winter, so she convinces her brother to join her in taking their old raft down the river to town to call their aunt in New York. Survival, self-sufficiency, caring people, doing what you have to do are all part of this story. And this book is also on my longer children's list because it kind of um, covers both upper elementary and, and beginning middle, middle school ages. Mm. Really well done. While Polonius Mitchell enjoys pulling pranks at school to get a rise out of their teacher and the principal, there is no way he or his best friend Nehemiah would do anything dangerous. A gun was found in the park near the, next to the school and the administration is on the alert as well they should be. Thelonious is more than irritated that the first place anyone looks for the guilty party is a special education classroom where he is, where neuroatypical students do their best and occasionally cause trouble. He is now determined to solve this crime, along with Nehemiah, to prove their innocence. Mr. Blockman is assigned to work with Thelonious and guide him to better choices and decisions. And the unfair accusations and suspicions hurt and Thelonious's growth as a leader with integrity is delightful to see. This is a companion book to her previous books, Awkward and Brave. It takes place in the same middle school. It's a full color graphic novel of the middle school students we have come to know in the first two books. Here the focus is on Jorge, who slowly begins to realize he is off kilter around Jasmine because he likes her. And he just doesn't know what to do about that. Mm -hmm. It's a new experience for him. 
Jorge is big, so no one messes with him, and that, and so he patrols the halls between classes to step in when needed. He is also kind and thoughtful. He's a really great character. I forgot to mention that I have this paper that has notes on it, and I'm sticking to it because I get all my points made, and mm -hmm. I'll be done in our time frame. <laughs> Otherwise, we could be here for I, a lot longer. Will hang, you know, they'll go away, but they'll watch the long thing later. So. This is a graphic novel told in alternating times of now and then. The authors and illustrator tell of brothers Kwame, who's the older brother, and Ibo, who's 12, and their hopes for a new, better life in Europe. This is told from Ibo's point of view. When he woke up in the morning, his older brother Kwame had already left their village on the bus. Ibo follows, hoping to find him in the city of Agadez in Niger. They fortunately find each other and face harm hardships, some life-threatening, on their way to a better life. Not everyone makes it. And this was actually published in um, the second half of 2018, but I didn't encounter it until mm. last year. So it went on my list because, you know, m most of the time my lists are done in time for the October conference, and then there's still... But then there's still a few months left of the year, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So things get... Okay. Newberry Award winner, first Ooh. graphic novel to win the Newberry. Yay! I'm excited. <laughs> this is one of my favorite books, too. It is also on the 20, 2020 Great Graphic Novels list. And it, he also received the Coretta Scott King Author Award for this book. So, pretty tremendous. Jordan Banks, who loves drawing, is new to the Riverdale Academy Day School and discovers he is one of only a few people of color in the seventh grade. This school is much larger and more confusing than his previous school. Finding friends and his way are difficult, especially with some students and teachers who are less than aware of their troubling viewpoints. As Book List says, this remarkably honest and accessible story is not just about being new, it's unabashedly about race. Still, the artwork and Jordan, now this is me talking again, the artwork and Jordan's own sketchbook lighten the mood to make it, to make the point, but not sound too harsh, I guess is the way I want to put it. And Kirkus notes, this is a book for every middle school. And that was before the award was, was given. Theodore, or Trace Carter, he's in middle school, now lives with his Aunt Leah since the death of his parents in a car accident. He was in that car too, but he survived. Moving from Baltimore to Brooklyn, missing his parents, though his aunt is wonderful, and reliving the accident in his dreams, leaves Trace off kilter. Now he has seen a ghost, a little boy, in the basement of the New York Public Library. Oh. It turns out that he and the ghost have a connection, and there may be a reason that Trace can see him. Hmm. Always ghosts in the New York Public Library. It seems to be an ongoing problem I with them. It does seem <laughs> that, that's the place to go if you're a ghost, I guess. Although the CIP indicates this title as biography, I have it in fiction as I see it as a combination of fictionalized history and actual history, um, and it is poetry, so I don't know. Put it in the collection where you want somewhere. to. I'm just telling you, <laughs> this is what all I Whatever it is, it's a good book. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> it is voice, voices of objects that came into contact with Joan of Arc. There's also, so there's things from, things that she touched or, or something she wore, and it's talking about her. It's all in poetic form. There's also her own voice as from the trials that were mm -hmm. saved, so there's quotes from that, that, those archived items, and also of people who were at the trial, who spoke in praise of her, and some spoke in disgust of her. The course of her life is followed and gives a sense of the girl who led her army. It includes direct quotes from her trials. It is also, it also written in poetic forms from her time period, and at the hmm. back of the book, it identifies which poem is which poetic form. Ooh, so if you're working on poetic form, this is another way you can do that. April is National Poetry Month. That's right. Good call. If you do want to do something with poetry in your, is this middle? Oh yeah, middle school. Yeah, middle school. Middle school yeah. Yeah. And I also thought after you look at this book, you could challenge readers or the students in your class to write a poem about another famous person from the viewpoint of any object they held use, like mm -hmm. George Washington and the hatchet where he chopped down the cherry tree, which he really didn't do. <laughs> we made that up. But, and that's okay. So I'm kidding about that. But Kirkus says this will appeal to the fans of verse, history, and biography. Wow. And it's a slender book, too. So mm -hmm. Not too intimidating. Yes. Yeah. On a completely different note, 
This is a full color graphic novel. AJ is in sixth grade. He's age 11 and he has liked Mia for years but never told her. His best friend Hunter keeps encouraging him to talk to her to no avail. Mia is completely enthralled with vampires. So AJ decides to convince her that he is one. <laughs> First, he tries to watch the TV show Pang Squad. Uh, he hated that. That was no good. So he tries reading the book Moonlight, a novel about vampires. Are you getting any kind of hints here? <laughs> when the new teacher, Mr. Niles, pages pairs AJ and Mia for a project, it looks like his big chance. Their report will be on Transylvania, and AJ decides to lay a trail for her to the point that he actually drinks some fake blood only to find out that she is planning to be a vampire killer and she is out to get him. <laughs> Complicating that is the fact that one of the teachers in the school really is a vampire. Will they all oh. survive? It's, it's tongue-in-cheek and it's um, mm -hmm. not, it's, it's more humorous than scary, but it still is a lot of fun. Again, on a completely different note, this is Alan Gratz's newest book, as far as I know. And this book takes place all in one day, as you mm -hmm. might guess. June 6, 1944, D-Day. And we meet several people who are involved in D-Day. D. Carpenter is 16, and he is landing on Omaha Beach. And we encounter him several times throughout the book. because it, it changes from different locations, um, Omaha Beach and, and other places. Um, Samira Zidane is 11. She's a French-Algerian resistance member. And we encounter her a couple of times. I'll quit saying that because everybody shows up. James McKay is a Canadian paratrooper. And Bill Richards is a British tank driver. Monique Marchand is 13. She's a French citizen. And she and Dorothy Powell, a U.S. reporter, are helping soldiers on Omaha Beach, helping them get to the aid station, et cetera. And the loss of life, in particularly on Omaha Beach is portrayed and presented, but it's not overwhelming to the reader. So you get a sense of what a terrible thing that was, but also that some people survived and went on to invade France. As Kirkus says, in the end, all the threads come together to drive home the point that allies are stronger together. Mm -hmm. There's a 14-page author's note at the back that clarifies the truth and where Gratz took some poetic license for the sake of the story, one of the things that happens in the book, he had happening during the day and night of D-Day when actually it was the next day. So that's pretty close. I think that's okay. Not that he cares. I'm sure he cares about people's opinions. Teddy Youngblood is 13, and he's just finished his first week of football practice when something happened, and now he is in a coma with a head injury. Traditionally, the Friday practice ends with the seniors giving a kind of razzmatic up exercise called Rookie Rumble, to the freshmen to help with team bonding. Team bonding. The coaches were looking elsewhere and it is speculation what actually happened. So this takes place mm -hmm. mostly in his hospital room. Pe what people say while they're visiting Teddy is in, told in free verse. There are also text messages that are inserted in the story, interviews and other forms of communication is how the story is told. And every once in a while you get some fuzzy thoughts mm -hmm. that turn out to be Teddy trying to come back to consciousness. Mm -hmm. This is a full color graphic novel and it's, it's quite a bit of fun. There's some confusion at the beginning of the book and I think that echoes space confusion about middle school because middle school is different from elementary school and it's kind mm -hmm. of confusing and she's not sure what, where she's supposed to be or what's going on. But as she begins to find her way, the book settles down as well. Eighth grader Amanda invites her to join the soccer team, and Faith at first thinks they will be friends, and then won't that be great? But newbie Faith is on the third streak with other not-so-good players and rarely sees Amanda. Over time, friendships form, and the third-string team members discover that they are bad with soccer, but good with friendship, just as it says under mm -hmm. the title there. <laughs> and I thought that was great. They really do have form a strong um, team spirit about being friends, not so much about soccer, which is kind of fun. They still play. <laughs> okay. They're just not very good. <laughs> as long as they're enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. So it's finding oneself and connecting with others that makes middle school doable. This is a, from a Nebraska author who lives in Omaha. Hannah has never left the room she shares with her mother on the spaceship. They live on a sentient spaceship, and Hannah was genetically designed to communicate with the ship via the colors it shows. 
Hannah wakes up from another sleep time, wondering why things feel wrong. Hmm. It turns out everyone is gone, and a ship with several volunteers has landed to document the death of the ship. Oh. They will die there too, but other people will benefit from their final wishes. Now Hannah and Stan, a young man, try to find a way to survive beyond the ship, Cyclops. But there are things neither of them realizes about the other mercenaries and about Cyclops. Survival, ethics, not giving up, and some romance are included. It's an intriguing premise for a sci-fi adventure story. Hmm. At least like something I hadn't encountered before. Well, Gordon Corman, are we done? <laughs> so we even have to talk about it. Due to a misunderstanding, temporary transfer student Kiana Robini, Robini is not properly enrolled and is sent to room 117, which turns out to be the room assigned to the unteachable of Greenwich Middle School. Troublemakers, kids with learning disabilities, unusual situations at home, and some who push the boundaries are all in the class. Their teacher this year is Mr. Kermit, a disillusioned teacher who only wants to last through the year to his early retirement. At first, all Mr. Kermit does is sit in the room with the kids. No discipline, no interaction. He's working the crossword puzzle. <laughs> but over time, the teacher and the students begin to find some common ground and positive things are happening. It's touching, funny, and clever. This book brings what readers expect from Gordon Corman. And it is um, a Golden Sower 2021 Novels nominee. Uh, so that will be not this year's list, but next mm -hmm. year's. This is a graphic novel of the original book, The Giver, by Lois Lowry. Hmm. It's essentially the same story originally told in the text. The graphic novel version gives the boy slowly dawning knowledge and assists with the slow addition of color, color in the art. It's a good refresh for this classic. The first color that really comes through is red. Hmm. I think it's an apple he sees first as red, and he doesn't know what that, because he's never seen the color before. It's well done, and, and it's another way to look at The Giver. I can see you cool. using both the novel and the graphic novel mm -hmm. in the class study if you need to. And it is on the list of the 2020 great graphic novels, as is this book on the list, too. Middle school music class, the assignment is for each student to find the perfect song that matches who they are right now. Charlie, mm -hmm. Charlotte, is at a loss. Nothing is her right now until she hears Maria Callas sing opera. A student, Luca, is missing from class since he sang a song to another boy, Emil, and Charlie worries about where he is now. Beautifully told in art and text and music, this graphic novel is colored in browns and yellows for the present time, in blues for the past, and in reds for Maria Callas' life. Mm -hmm. It blends it all together through this girl. Mm -hmm. Brian is in sixth grade, and he is encouraged by his mother to be friends with Mike, someone who is polite to Brian's mother but a bit on the wild side when on his own. Mike takes Brian on some wild adventures, which are fun, but dangerous, and sometimes just wrong. Brian is confused and also challenged by Mike, by Mike about being brave and being a man, but is this really how he should do it? He's not sure. His father has anger issues, not with the family, but he uses his fists when he's angry or feeling put down, and Brian is headed that way. His dad has told him that it is better to be hard and feared than to be liked. That's his viewpoint. Hmm. But what feels good or tight to Brian are his comics and drawing superheroes. Brian walks a fine line, but in the end chooses to control his anger and stay with activities he enjoys, as well as limiting the drama in his life. So he's um, finding the right path for himself. This is a full-color graphic novel. In the introduction, the publisher states that this issue is a compound. And it's hard, probably should, because they've covered oh, yeah. up the title yeah. with this yeah. sticker. Good point. <laughs> it actually says Marvel Rising underneath there. Thank you. That's a good point. Yeah. If you have the paper in front of you, you can tell that, but some yeah. people don't have the paper. Yeah. Yeah. The title is Marvel Rising. And the publisher says this issue is a compilation of four comics. It is the transition story from the classic to the newly imagined in the tradition of expanding the Marvel Universe. So it mm -hmm. sounded kind of key to me yeah. if you have a, a collection of Marvel mm -hmm. graphic novels. In this one, Doreen Green, who is Squirrel Girl, is teaching a programming class, and one of her students is Camilla Khan, who is Miss Marvel. They are soon working together to thwart threats to members of the class and other passersby. There seems to be a new villain in town, and Doreen and Kamala are hard-pressed to protect both the citizens and their secret identities. It's a fun romp with some quick thinking and dilemmas for our heroes to face and to satisfy readers. 
Be sure to use the ISBN that's on the handout to find this. When I searched for it on Amazon under Marvel Rising, it brought up several choices, and it wasn't sure which was just one of the four comics and which was this compilation. Oh, right. And there were some other things. So use the ISBN to find So you can get them all together, the collection, yeah, in one, instead of one five, book. Yeah, or separate ones. This book is the 2019 winner of the Nebraska Center for the Book Young Adult Novel Award. So, um, it takes place in Lincoln, Nebraska. Flint is in sixth grade, he's 13, and he is losing his eyesight. It has been deteriorating for a while, and now he sits alone at lunch, working on his entry for the Find a Comic Book Star contest, hoping to finish it before his eyesight is completely gone. His former best friend now bullies him since Flint can no longer play on the football team like he used to, and now they call him Squint, because he's always squinting. Then one day, the new girl, Bakil, sits with him at lunch, and it is not part of a trick, which she thought it might be, because she is friends with the popular group. But he and Mikkel begin to, to form a friendship, and that's focused on Mikkel's brother Danny's challenges on YouTube, hitting topics such as bullying, empathy, loss, and friendship. As School Library Journal says, recommend for any library serving middle grade readers. And they say it is for grades five to seven, so again, that mm, going over between upper elementary and yeah. middle school. Another full color graphic novel, though more in muted colors, um, this is titled Good for Grades 7 to 12, I'd say. It's the first of the new DC Ink line. This was the first one for young adults. And it introduces the reader to Mira from Aquaman and tells her story, not his. Mm -hmm. So he's And she <laughs> admires and wishes to emulate her deceased mother who was a warrior for their nation. On her own, she decides to take on the job of killing Arthur Curry, who is at this time unaware that he is the heir to Atlantis. But she finds love instead. Mira is capable, intelligent, and strong. And since this one was published, uh, several other titles focusing on each independent character have been published. Mm -hmm. um, Catwoman and Teen Titans, Raven, Harley yep. Quinn, etc. I, I haven't gotten mm -hmm. a hold of any of those because I only read this one. So the others are probably terrific too. Have you read any of those? Uh, actually, we have them. I can bring them in for you. Read, yeah, if you want. I know we have Raven and Catwoman okay. personally at home. I don't. Might have the Harley Quinn. I'll check. <laughs> Thank you. I can have an amendment to my list. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I have to start working on 2022. This is true. Yeah. Start reading <laughs> I have new books. Two yeah. Books already for my 2020. That's right. It's still just the beginning of February. It's just, yeah. Okay. It's early. It's early <laughs> time. The subtitle of this is a, t a Tale Told in Ten Blocks. Okay, At Plum Creek Festival, Jason Reynolds said that publishers do not want to call this a short story collection because they believe kids and teens do not read short story collections. I believe they what? will read this one. And you can title it however yeah. you want. At the end of the school day, students re-enter their usual lives of friendship, bullying, negotiating the way home, and facing life while doing so. Characters and stories connect with each other. So throughout, you'll see characters pop up again. Um, the students mm -hmm. face fears and bullies, questioning of one's own sexuality, and also an appreciation of a strong friendship and other issues. Reynolds uses sincerity, humor, and bases it in reality. As Booklist said, here Reynolds exhibits his mastery of character. Each protagonist is distinct, engaging, sympathetic, complex, each story uniquely memorable. And it's uh, not a long book, so again, that's appealing in another way that it's uh, very readable. Carter's 12, and his family is a little broken. His father is serving in the army in Germany, and he and his mother and three younger sisters are still reeling from his younger brother's death three years ago at age six. The book opens with the arrival of Carter's grandfather's butler, Mr. Bowles Fitzpatrick. Recently deceased, his grandfather had willed the butler to the family. The butler insists on using proper English and proper decorum, and he also has a fondness for the game of cricket. The masterful way with Mr. Bowles Fitzgerald guides and helps Carter and his family, as well as the other young players who have joined the cricket team, is engaging and honest. Humor and lots of cricket terms will entertain readers or drive them crazy, but you can skip over some of them if you want to. Yes, if you know cricket, it would mm -hmm. be nice, but it might um, be a way to learn it. it yes, it's, it's <laughs> I can help you learn a little bit about cricket, and that's kind of fun. So I wouldn't call this a sport book, but you kind of have some sports in it. 
Jimmy, 13, is stunned to learn that he is expected to give a short eulogy at his cousin's funeral the next day. His dress pants are too small and may tear at any time, and he has nothing positive to say about Patrick, who ruined everything he attended. Birthdays, family get-togethers, every time he went over the top and ruined it. He was too boisterous and always going too far. Jimmy tries to find something positive to say while hiding during the viewing at the mortuary, but each positive start soon diminishes into the chaos Patrick brought with him. Finally, as Jimmy is standing at the pulpit, the truth he needs to say comes to him, and it touches those listening, especially Patrick's younger sister, Sophia, who is deaf and whose quiet calm had helped Jimmy speak. This is also a Golden Sower 2021 nominee. And for people from other states, I didn't mention yeah. that the Golden Sower is the Nebraska Children's Choice Award. So you can look under. Uh, if you just Google Golden Sower yeah. Nebraska, you'll find the you'll website find, all about it website. with all the lists on them. Yep. You can find the list. Thank you. I've done it that way. That's, <laughs> when I wasn't that's sure when the fastest way for me. <laughs> Cass, age unclear, has a special gift. In her past, she drowned, but managed to get back to life, and now she can see spirits or ghosts. If she looks at a particular angle, she can see the veil that separates our world of the living from the dead. Her best friend is a ghost, as a matter of fact. He helped her out of the water that drowned her. Her parents have put together an investigation show about finding ghosts and the three of them are off to Edinburgh, Scotland, the city of ghosts. They have no ability to see them, and Cass is not going to tell them that she can, because she knows what would happen then. The show would be all about her. While in Edinburgh, Cass encounters a girl who also has the gift, and Cass learns more about why they have this ability. Danger, spookiness, there's a touch, I can handle it, because I'm a chicken. <laughs> big chicken. <laughs> big, big chicken. And concern for what her parents might accidentally stumble into keep cast busy. Book two, Tunnel of Bones, takes place in Paris, and that is out now. I haven't read it yet. Mm -hmm. City of Ghosts is also a Golden Sower Novels nominee for 2021. Have all made the list. Maybe the second one will be on your list for 2020, if it came out well, this year. Well, it came out um, August. Nah. No, that's not true. That was this one. <laughs> it came out. I must I'll check. Anyway, we're on to kiss number eight. This is on the 2020 Great Graphic Novel list as well. It's in black, white, and gray. High school junior Amanda, or Mads, has a lot happening right now. She has fun with her best friend, Kat. She is avoiding getting kissed by her neighbor, neighbor Adam. He seems interested in her. She's not interested in him. She goes to minor league baseball games with her dad, and they have a great time there. But her dad is hiding something big, and it might destroy their family, and she's not sure what it is. She is beginning to realize she does not want to kiss Adam because she really wants to kiss Kat, her girlfriend. She finds some new friends at school who do not label themselves. How many kisses will it take for her to find and get who she really wants? As Kirkus says, the characters shine, fully human and permitted to be flawed, which is nice. Yeah. I'm flawed. <laughs> Gabe is 11, and he must climb onto the roof to rescue a prized chicken in a storm, and that is when he loses his life, sort of. A tornado picks him up, and the next thing he remembers is waking up in his caregiver's bed with his dog, Ollie, next to him. Soon he realizes he is dead, and he is run off by the townspeople. After a few days and nights in the woods, a girl finds him and leads him to Bone Hollow. He discovers that when the girl is deaf and has been for years, now she is tiring, and Gabe is her replacement. Having already lost his parents and then his grandpa, Gabe doesn't think he can take anyone away from their families. That just isn't something he can do. But maybe that isn't exactly what Wynn does. It's a bit of the supernatural, some spookiness, and some tenderness. This look at death and how people pre prepare for it is thoughtful and comforting. Now we'll go into some nonfiction for teens, and this is going to be hard, a couple of them, including this first one. This is Anderson's memoir in free verse. It is her personal experience and journey after being raped at age 13. It is honest and accusing at times. As she says in the introduction, this is the story of a girl who lost her voice and wrote herself a new one. Because she wrote the book. Speak. Mm. Sorry. Booklet says her sensitive, incisive book is essential for all young people. And it is a top 10 of the 2020 Quick Picks for Reluctant Young Readers list. That was announced in January with the other. 
Strangers assume my girlfriend is my nurse. Is a set of 23 essays about his thoughts, his life, and how he functions. And it is a follow-up to his first set of essays titled, Laughing at My Nightmare. Shane again hops around a bit while explaining what his life is like with spinal muscular atrophy, or SMA. And he tells it like it is. Bathroom humor, quips, and some offensive language are included, as well as clear information on, he, on how he and his brother or father or friends get something done. Mostly humorous and occasionally eye-opening as to some of the things people ask him. Really? I can't believe that. Some Don't people it have some nerve, yeah, yeah. I, I think, yeah. Just so you know, Chapter 17 is titled, Your Complete Guide to Shane's Sex Life, where he assures re readers that he can and does have sex without revealing any details. Perfect. Yeah. Don't pay him a bet. This is a graphic memoir in blues, reds, and black. It is marketed as an adult title, but she does spend quite a bit of the book, five of the eight chapters, on her childhood through college. Hmm. Starting with how both of her parents came to the U.S., her mom from the Philippines and her dad from Egypt, met, married, had a child, and eventually divorced. She works her way through identity issues. Is she Muslim? Or is she Christian? Or is she, how, how can she be both? Um, plenty of microaggressions, such as, you are so F. Exotic, excuse me, you are so exotic. And I didn't even know you were as ethnic. Again, the things people say are it, it concludes with meeting then marrying the man for her and her hopes for the future. And this is a top 10 of the 2020 great graphic novels list. So I, I'm really happy I had that on my list. <laughs> okay. This is an important book, but it is also a hard book to read at times. It includes some details of a few well-publicized rapes and the resulting court decisions, noting more than once that men are raped as well as women. She quotes a CDC survey, one in five women and one in 71 men will be raped during their lifetime. And over 50% of gender non-conforming individuals are raped. That's just a horribly astounding number, mm. over 50%. The author defines rape culture and how it and toxic masculinity have compounded the problem. She gives suggestions of how to help bring about change at the end of most of the chapters. Booklist says, this book isn't an exhaustive look at the topic, but it is a straightforward, well-organized overview for young people. And School Library Journal says, highly recommended for every library that serves teens. You put it in your collection where you think it belongs. Because mm -hmm. you know your community Mm -hmm. And I, I won't tell you how to do, handle that. Fiction for older readers. Oh man, I'm gonna get that. Okay, it's okay. <laughs> this is a wonderful book. I I ha did not read her first one, which I believe was um, Poet X. Poet X, yes. Yeah. Because Jill read that one. So. <laughs> Amoni Santiago is in her senior year at high school. She is thinking of the future, but also about her daughter Emma, who's two and her abuela, with whom they live. Imoni is Afro-Latina. She loves cooking in the kitchen and has an almost magical touch. And those who eat what she has cooked always comment on how the food helps them with, with, with whatever issue is in their lives. She wants to become a chef, but that may be impossible. A new elective offered during her senior year is just what she needs, including a chance to go with a class to Spain and work with a chef there for a week. Imoni takes on so much, Still, she's not sure it will result in what she wishes for. And I read something that the author was talking about recently, and she said she wanted to highlight a person who had some tough situations but was endeavoring to get, get on with her life and move forward mm -hmm. and be positive. And she doesn't want this to be seen as what a miracle that she got out of this spiraling situation, but that she handles things. And it's not easy, mm -hmm. but she's doing it. And there's a lot of people out there are doing the same thing. A that lot of the but, point the author was making. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of teens who are probably struggling in the same with their own things, but the same way. Right. Yeah. yeah. Swing by Kwame Alexander and Mary Rand Hess. Noah is 17 and white, and he has feelings for longtime friend Samantha, they call her Sam, but has yet to say anything to her. His best friend Walt is African American, and he's now going by the name Swing. He encourages him to let Sam know how he feels. Walt is determined to make the baseball team so this coming for this coming year, and he has a love of jazz. 
so both combined for his new self-imposed nickname. When Noah finds some old love letters in a gently used handbag he bought for his mother, he is inspired to use them as a guide to write to Sam, but he is caught off guard when Swing gives her one anonymously. All of this is swept aside after a tragedy in the park. Jazz, poetry, and art, love, told in free verse, as Kirkus says, Noah is the narrator, but it is Swing, with his humor, irresistible charm, and optimism, who steals the spotlight. Abby, 17 and a senior, and her family must move away from Omaha after her mother's, a teacher's, affair comes to light. Abby was abandoned by her friends and bullied until they left town. Now they are in Rochester, Minnesota, homeless, and Abby is trying to keep a very low profile at her new school. school. She has some new great friends, a possible boyfriend, and some success at school, and she is waiting for this other shoe to drop, and eventually it does. The stigma of homelessness, at least in Abby's mind, the hardship of sleeping in their van in the cold, eating at soup kitchens, and looking for work is lived by Abby and her family. Emma Saylor Payne, 17, has been fortunate that her father provides all she needs and she has never had a job until she spends three weeks on Lake North with her maternal grandmother, whom she barely remembers. Now Emma is called Saylor because that is what her mother, who died of a drug overdose, had called her. Meeting family, aunts, cousins, good friends, she last visited when she was four. It is strange and then it is familiar. She begins to learn the stories everyone on the lake already knows and begins to see things from a new perspective. She soon jumps in to help clean the rooms of the motel her grandmother owns, and there's always plenty needing to be done and not enough people to do it. When her father and new stepmom return from their honeymoon, she must spend two more weeks at the lake, but on the ritzy side this time. Mm -hmm. She is uncomfortable with that and worries about how her mother's family is doing. Coming of age and embracing the opportunity to see life from more than one viewpoint. Road trip. Just as his senior year of high school begins, Stephen Gable, a.k.a. Stiggy, takes his mom's credit card, his late father's car, and he hits the road. He has to get going. <laughs> he doesn't know where he doesn't have a destination. He just has to drive. He finds himself on the Great River Road, which he didn't even know existed. While he meanders, he encounters people who become new friends and a few who use him or rob him. Handling grief, finding out who you are now, and discovering how long you can keep driving is all included in this one. This is a little spooky. Adele, mm -hmm. 17, has recently stopped taking her meds. Her father and their doctor believed she had mental issues since she used to claim to see and talk with dead people, like her mother did. Mm -hmm. She hasn't seen any for years due to the medication, but now she's beginning to see them again. One of them is her former best friend, Tori, who asks her to find out who killed her. Adele had attended the mm -hmm. party at Tori's house the night she was killed. Not usually a drinker, Adele did drink at this party, and now she begins to think she might be guilty of the murder since they had been learning about blackout drinking in school, and she cannot remember how she got from walking away from the party back to her home. As she closes in on what's happened, the murderer may be closing in on her. So obviously she is not. Yeah. But if you can only buy one new April Henry book, um, I think you should go with this one. That one's pretty good if you like, you know, helping ghosts. <laughs> This one, there are run, hide, and fight back are the three choices several teens face when a shooting occurs at a Portland shopping mall. Mm -hmm. Some pe teens hide, some are captured and held as hostages, and some people are killed immediately. There seems little hope for those who have been captured. They are being used as a shield. While a few teens have found refuge in the back hall linking the stores, it is likely only a matter of time before they will be found. And this thriller will capture teens' attention, I think, and... Um, it's, it's, of course, April Henry, so it's well-written, and, mm -hmm. and it moves right along. And unfortunately, very timely. Yeah, and unfortunately, too. This book is entirely written in text messages between two people. Hmm. So that might drive you crazy, or it might be okay. <laughs> I was okay with it. There are two fellas named Martin and Nathaniel Monroe II. They are cousins, and are, they are both in Haley's high school history class. When she receives a text from one of them, she asks, which one? You're both in U.S., my U.S. history class. To which the reply is, the good one. <laughs> Thus, throughout the book, she thinks she is Helpful. texting with the Martin she thinks of as the good one, when it is actually the other Martin. Hmm. This, the format, like I said, might be considered tedious, but it does kind of help the book move along, too. It's just a little bit thicker, but it moves right along. 
Ultimately, this is an interesting story of high school, communication, and potential romance. Hmm. And, you know, when you make, make, somebody, written, yeah. make somebody answer specifically, who are you? <laughs> I'm just kidding. It turns out he's not such a bad guy. Three years ago, there was a school shooting at the Virgil County High School. Three of the four survivors who were, who were in the line of fire in different places gather each year on the anniversary of the shooting, and they are not gathering at the school that day. As it says on the inside front cover, a story has grown up around one of the vic victims, Sarah McHale, that says she died proclaiming her Christian faith, but Leanne Bauer was there with her best friend, Sarah, and knows what happened, and she has a choice. Stay silent and let people believe in Sarah's martyrdom or tell the truth. The fact is, someone else wore the necklace and said those words, but she and her family were basically run out of town proclaiming the story for her. And so now there's going to be a movie made about it. And, oh. And um, Leanne, I'm sorry, Leanne is struggling with, should I just let it keep moving and not say anything? And, and why didn't I help this girl when mm -hmm. I could have spoken up then? Mm -hmm. And it's not the fact, and, and it, it is the fact that somebody did say that to the shooter. Mm -hmm. And it's just not, not the right not person. The, who it was, was attributed yeah. to. So, another mm -hmm. tough book, but well done. So, if you want something a little lighter, Kimmy is a high school senior, and she is supposed to be working on her ultimate painting that will be submitted as part of her application to the Lou Fine Arts Academy following her high school graduation. Instead, she has been focused on creating clothing, Kimmy Originals, because it brings her joy. Then a letter from her mother's estranged parents in Japan invites Kimmy to, to visit during the two-week spring break period. After her mother finds out that Kimmy has painted nothing, Kimmy takes the opportunity and flies to Kyoto. Yeah, I'll be away from mom for two weeks. <laughs> Over the course of the two weeks, she learns a lot about her, her grandparents, a new boyfriend, and herself. I think um, chaste is one word you can use for this book, mm -hmm. the AR. It is a romance, but mm -hmm. they are in Japan. Yeah. I don't know if that, is that um, what's the word I want? Stereotyping? Maybe? I just did no. that. Sorry. <laughs> Could have been. This is hashtag murder trending is the name of the book, if you can't quite see it. Mm -hmm. It is uh, gruesome, icky. This is not my kind of book, but I could read it. I haven't read the second one yet. <laughs> Dee was quickly convicted and sentenced to her about for her stepsister's murder, and now she has been sent to Alcatraz 2.0, run by the postman, which was supposed to be only for the most heinous of criminals. So why is she here? She will eventually be be killed by one of several sanctioned killers who carry out the sentence, all shown on a pay channel on television. Each killer has his or her own persona, and torture is allowed. Inmates cannot harm each other. They must wait for their turn with one of the killers. Um, your family's threatened, for one thing, to keep you from harming other people. It's all to entertain the masses while their sentences are carried out, except Dee did not kill Monica. How could she prove it and get out of that, this situation? The mm -hmm. sequel is titled Hashtag Murder Funding. Mm -hmm. And I just haven't picked that up. Well, I did once, but I put it back. Not not every book is for everyone. That's but true. But this this was well done. Mm -hmm. And so on another note, Sophie and her band friends are involved in fundraising over the summer before her senior year in order to pay for the band trip to to perform in the Rose Parade. Sophie has the idea to ask country singing star Megan Pleasant to perform at a fundraising event since Megan lived in Acadia when she won the Next Country Star Shows contest. Unfortunately. Megan has made it, made it clear she will never return. Along with everything else, Sophie has fun spending time with August, the new guy in town, though she is avoiding any romantic type of behavior as she believes that she is asexual. <laughs> Shaya has become a courier for the Jewish resistance in Poland due to her fair hair and skin color. Using forged documents, she becomes a Polish girl. She smuggles food, documents, and when possible, people to save lives. Things get infinitely harder when Chaya and Esther end up with a mission on their own. Esther is not experienced and China, Chaya does not trust her, but they are sent to the Warsaw Ghetto after their group is shattered. Descriptions of hardship, starving, torture are more implied than detailed. Chaya hmm. says several times that the Jewish resistance members did not expect to survive, only to make a difference. Hmm. As it says on the book jacket, 
So the Jewish resistance never had much of a chance against the Nazis. They were determined to save as many lives as possible and to live or die with honor. And this is a Golden Sower 2020-21 novel list nominee also. This is the first book in the Comey Can't Communicate series. Comey is the ultimate student at the high school, and others are afraid to talk to her because she is aloof and extraordinary. Padano is just happy he is now going to Etan Private High School, and he is planning to blend in and not be noticed. But the first day of school, he finds himself alone in the classroom with Comey after all of the students and teachers have left. There he discovers that Comey is not aloof. She freezes whenever she tries to speak to someone. She wants to make friends, and now Tadano has promised to help her make 100 friends, starting with him. The artwork showing Comey with huge eyes or frozen and trembling does a great job of conveying her level of discomfort and social anxiety. Mm -hmm. And I've only read this one, the first one. I think there are a few more out now, and I'm going to have to get my hands on them because it was really fun and interesting. This is a full-color graphic novel. There are, I think, a total of five being expected in the series, as far as I can tell so far. Nicholas Cox is the illegitimate son of a retired fencing champion. He is determined to earn a place on the King's Row School's fencing team, though he has a long way to go to prove himself. His half-brother, Jesse Cox, and prodigy, Seiji Katayama, will be challenging for him to defeat or even keep up with. When he arrives at the school, Nicholas finds that Seiji is his roommate. Very little school action here. It is all about the fencing and the competition to get on the school's fencing team. One competitor is a cad. He is sleeping around with one handsome guy after another. That's just kind of par for the course in this book. This is volume one, and there's fence volume two. Mm -hmm. 24 matches are held over three days to determine the team membership. Nicholas lost his first match, but there are plenty more to give him the chance to make the team. This volume is all competition, which is not yet completed at the end of the book, but no worries, there's book three's three. out already, <laughs> so yay. The final matches are held to determine who will make the King's Row fencing team. Nicholas and CJ face off, and Nicholas is sure his chances are gone. But there is a surprise in store for the competitors. And of this list, books two and three are on the 2020 Great Graphic Novels list because they came out. I think the, um, the well, first volume one came out actually in 2018, but I included it because how can you read two you and three without start reading with two? One? Yeah, <laughs> I'm I'm very fond of reading mm -hmm. things all of them in, in order. order yeah. yeah, interesting on the covers how they have one, two, and three of the characters. You notice yes that. for volume one, two. Plus and three. everybody always looks so fierce. Yeah, I said you have to look like that if you're in competition. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well <laughs> if you want to, and um, be intimidating. They, ultimately, they're hoping to win the championship of the school fencing with other schools. So right. Since things are determined in this one, and I won't tell you the answer, um, I'm assuming that the next uh, volumes will start. So determines the, who gets on the team and then right. following is going to be now competing against other schools. Right. I, yeah. I could be wrong. Is, are the other volumes out yet or are we only up to, I, you know? No, let's see. I don't say. Uh -huh. There you might be another one out by yeah. now. The Field Guide to the North American Teenager. This is the 2020 Morris Award winner. That's for a debut book. This is his first book. Um, ben Philippe is the author. In the book, Doris Kaplan, a black French Canadian, is now living in Austin, Texas. Because he moved there. His family moved there. He is smart, clever, and a little pessimistic. A tough, tough combination for the Texans to handle. Handle. Now in a new high school, constantly sweating profusely because he's unaccustomed to the hot weather, he steps back from everyone and judges who they are and what they do. Over time, he begins to see the other students as people, some he likes and some he does not. And after he makes a bad mistake, he realizes he has to step up, face the music, and see what he can do with his life. I make him sound unpleasant. He's really a pretty likable character. And some of the other char characters in his life are really pretty swell, but he's sure that they have a, an ulterior motive a couple of them. So, and it, it's humorous, and it also is, um, oh, he, he does talk a bit about how he knows how American schools are because he's seen some of those TV shows like you know I can't I can't remember what oh maybe it's Pretty Little Liars or stuff like that so that's what school is like in America so that's kind of fun. Denise Farber is 17 and her mom and new stepdad who is pretty okay have just moved back to New Orleans several years after Hurricane Katrina. The house on 312 Argonne Street hence the name Agony House. Her mom hopes to repair and turn into a bed and breakfast needs a lot of work. And it appears to have a ghost or two. 
one friendly and one not. She is accused of, her family is accused of being carpet beggars by another girl in the neighborhood. And um, she says, but we used to live here. We were moving back. After Denise and her new friend, neighbor, Terry, a guy, find an old comic book hidden in the attic, they begin to put together what happened in the house many years ago. The book contains occasional three to four page graphic novel type inserts that contain the comic book story. She needs to find out what happened in the past because dangerous things keep happening here in the house. Bricks fall, fall floors collapse, and there is a spooky voice every so often. And she needs to get that all taken care of. This is a debut novel. It's long, but good. It's an, um, Jack is a high school senior. He has two best friends, Jillian, whom he pines for, and Franny, Francisco, who is now Jill's boyfriend. Then he meets Kate, a college freshman, and she is it for him. Kate dies of sickle cell anemia, and Jack is thrown back to the past where he first met her. Is he supposed to do something to prevent her death? What? But then, in his concern for Kate, he messes up things with Franny. He relives the four months five times in the book, though later he says it was, at least, it was at least three dozen times. He reduced it for the readers. Can he ever get everything right so they can all move forward? This is a full color graphic novel by Rainbow Rowell, our Omaha author. Yay, Rainbow. Yay. <laughs> Deja and Josiah, who goes by Josie, are great friends and have worked together each fall at the pumpkin patch. This is the last day of their last fall together. Deja is determined to get Josie to talk to his four-year crush, the fudge girl. He is reluctant. This final evening is a whirlwind of hitting different parts of the patch to try to find his crush. They encounter a snack thief, a runaway goat, the maze, lots of chances to eat, all of sure. Josie suffers anxiety about actually talking to fudge girl. As School Library Journal says, the characters in this graphic novel are so expressive and authentic it's impossible not to love them. The dialogue is cute, funny, and punny. And it is also on the 2020 Great Graphics Novel list. Yay, Rainbow! And my last book on the list is by, edited by E.B. Zoboy, Black Enough, Stories of Being Young and Black in America. There are 17 stories by well-known African-American authors, and I think the subtitle says it all. This is indeed a short story collection, but it is really well done, and it and it's combined together. Mm -hmm. There aren't carryover characters, but the flow is great. Mm -hmm. And it is a 2020 quick pick for reluctant young adult readers list member too. Mm -hmm. so, so thank you. All right. Do we have any comments from anybody? Uh, let's see. Anybody books? have any comments, questions, um, ideas of book titles of your own? Go ahead and type it into the um, question section of your GoToWebinar interface. Um, yeah, sure. And we'll get out of here. So uh, the recording, as we mentioned earlier, will be available afterwards. And um, the list, the book list, with a link to the list, right, um, will point. be included. And um, the slides too. We always put up the slides as well, in case you, you know, you're a visual rememberer. Remember, I am a visual rememberer. <laughs> that um, you'll have those as well available afterwards. The everything will be on our Encompass Live website. So um, go ahead and type in Encompass Live okay. there. And actually, wait, let me go up here. All right, go ahead and type in. No, yeah, you can okay. find it on our website. But also, if you just type Encompass Live into your search engine of choice, so far we're the only thing called that on the internet. Yay! So you will come across our website, oh, right. Rathnet of Encompass Live. Um, these are upcoming shows, but I said I would tell you this is where the archives will be. Uh, hopefully by the end of the day today, as long as go to webinar and YouTube cooperates with me, it will be posted up here. It's the most recent one, um, and you can see here is our best new children's book, the companion show right, to this yeah. one. Where you see we have the recording, the presentation slides, and the, the children's handout, as well as the summer reading program. One was in the end of December. Same thing. So if you're looking for book titles for your summer reading coming up. Um, for all ages of the summer reading, yes. <laughs> um, you'll have that there. Um, this is our full archive. You can run a search on here if you want to and um, find any of our previous shows. Do um, You can also limit to jump something in the most recent 12 months if you want to. Just pay attention if you are searching the full archives. This is our entire archive going back to January 2009 when Encompass Live premiered. Yay. And <laughs> you just pay attention to the date of when something was um, originally broadcast when you're looking at things. There will be things here that are old, outdated, 
um, information has changed, links to web to things like um, not work, services or products might no longer exist or have changed drastically over time. So um, just pay attention to that when you are um, on our archives here. Uh, next week's show on Encompass Live is legal research for non-lawyers and librarians. So we do get this coming into libraries a lot. I'm sure people come in and ask you for, you know, help doing tax forms, help wanting with help with medical information. But if you have been asking about um, legal research, um, we will have staff here come with us um, next week from our um, from here in um, Nebraska, the Schmidt Law Library at the University of Nebraska. Um, Richard Leader and Keelan Weber from there will be coming, as well as Maureen Eck, who's from our Nebraska State Law Library, the Supreme Court Deputy Librarian. Okay. So they're going to talk about the kind of things you can, you, we do have available for people if you do need to help. You know, with the, of course, the usual disclaimer, I am not a lawyer, so do not take this as legal advice, but we can help you. Some information. Yes, and here's some things that are out there that um, can be used. So please do sign up for that next week's show and any of our other upcoming episodes come um, for Encompass Live. I also will want to remind everyone about Big Talk from Small Libraries. This is coming up at the end of this month, February 28th, the last Friday of February. Big Talk from Small Libraries is our annual online conference with presentations from libraries, um, people from libraries who have a population served of 10,000 or less. That is our cutoff month. These are the little guys. So if you are at a small library or interested in what small libraries, your colleagues at small libraries are doing, take a look at um, our schedule here. It is free and open for anyone to watch. It is an all-day event on um, Friday, February 28th. The schedule is available here. Um, we have the topics of all our shows here. We're waiting for some full information about descriptions and things, at least you can get an idea of um, the topics and who all our presenters are. Register for it on our registration page and you will get the link to log in for the day. It works the same way as Encompass Live does. We use our GoToWebinar software to run this event as well. So um, definitely sign up for Big Talk and Small Libraries if you want to uh, join us for the day. We do... So all those times are central. Oh, it says right there, central. Time. Yes, we post it because we're in the right. central time, everything's central. Um, so adjust for your time zone wherever you are across the country um, or the world. We don't care. We're open to anybody. <laughs> um, the entire day is recorded every year as well, so if you're not available on February 20th, that's okay. As you can see here, we've got our previous conferences and recordings from all the previous years. The recorded sessions will all be up there as well for you if you cannot join, um, be there on February 28th. So sign up for Big Talk from Cell Library, sign up for upcoming um, Encompass Live shows, and we'll see you online in one of those places in the future. Great. Thanks so much, Sally. looks like nobody had any, just a few thank yous for you, so that's great. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Think later of a title that I really should look at. Send me an email. Yeah, should you send an email? Look on our website. You can find her contact info there. It's easy. Yeah. Um, give her some tips of uh, their books to read, and as, as throughout the year as well, so we can work on the 2020 yeah. list. 2020 list. <laughs> Working on it now. Yeah. All right. So thank you, everybody, and we'll see you next time on Encompass Live. Thank you, Krista. Yeah. Thank you. Bye bye. bye.